Welcome to the Integral Investing Podcast entitled Deep Ocean Mining and Decarbonization. Abundant clean energy is central to the decarbonization of the global economy, as we all know. But the production of wind, solar, and geothermal power, as well as energy storage, requires massive amounts of natural resources such as lithium, cobalt, nickel, and copper, to name a few. Unfortunately, the best land ores have already been mined and new resources come from rainforests and pristine landscapes where mining generates large toxic waste. So the main question remains, how can humanity close the resource gap to achieve the transition to a decarbonized economy by 2050? To address this question, I have invited to the podcast Jared Barron, the CEO and founder of the Metals Company that is enabling the battery power shift to clean energy and electric vehicles with the lightest planetary touch. Jared's mission is to help transition Earth from fossil fuels toward a circular resource economy. Daniel Schmachtenberger is another brilliant thinker who is also joining us today and whom I have interviewed already before, so please listen to that interview as well. He is the founder of the Civilization Research Initiative and an internationally recognized strategic advisor on catastrophic risk, exponential tech, and coordination challenges. My co-interviewer today is brilliant system scientist and futurist, Dr. Annalise Smitsman. Full disclosure, I was so impressed with the positive impact of the metals company after the interview that I went out and wanted to put my money where my mouth is and I purchased their stock. Daniel, I'd like to start with you. You're an integral thinker and uh, you saw something that I could contribute to your journey, our journey, uh, by introducing me to um, Jared Barron. Um, I know we had this meta crisis um, long conversation, uh, but I would still like to invite you to frame a little bit this conversation from your own um, uh, perspective so that we could then dive into uh, Gerard's contribution. Sure. Um, yeah, in that conversation that I really enjoyed with you, and maybe you can link that in the uh, show notes here also, uh, we went in some depth into uh, what we call the metacrisis assessment and what needs to happen. So I won't redo that here, but just very briefly, the concept of the metacrisis is that there are a lot of catastrophic and some even existential risks facing humanity currently and in the you know years and decades ahead that are novel, that are not things that were facing the world at any time previously in human history. Obviously, the world has always been at risk of super volcanoes and asteroids and things like that, but um, we were never at risk of AI autonomous weapons issues or nuclear winter or synthetic bio issues or planetary boundaries. Those are things that require uh, both, that require either exponential tech or at least very powerful tech like nuclear tech or industrial tech multiplied by generations of cumulative effects and 8 billion people and the huge amount of resource per capita that is uh, going into the world. So rather than just look at there's a climate crisis, but there's a lot of other environmental crises, there's ocean acidification from both climate, but also nitrogen den zones and phosphorus and overfishing and uh, microplastics and forever chemicals. There was just a, a article published that uh, the PFAS and PFAS, the fluorinated surfactants have passed planetary boundaries as defined by the EPA and other regulatory agencies in rainwater all around the world. Um, you know, like there's so many environmental crises, the planetary boundary framework is a pretty overarching framework to say for the planet to continue to function well, soil and biodiversity and temperature and Many things have to stay within certain ranges, and we're getting very near as the result of industrial technology, cumulative effects over a few centuries, and the increasing demand on those. The front side of the materials economy is take stuff from nature faster than nature can replenish it, which looks like deforestation, demineralization, soil loss, overfishing, you know, et cetera, and then turn it into pollution and trash and waste faster than nature can process it, which looks like all of the toxicity and pollution issues. 
to solve that, we have to go to a closed loop materials economy. We're not taking stuff from nature or putting stuff into nature faster than natural process. That's a humongous thing. That does not include all of the risks we face because you can go closed loop and that still doesn't mean we won't have a nuclear war. It still doesn't mean that we don't create uh, synthetic bio catastrophes either on accident through lab leaks, through gain of function research and things like that, or intentionally through bioweapons. Um, or issues associated with AI, nanotech, or the more advanced exponential tech, meaning um, distributed catastrophe weapons for everyone in a phase where drone weapons and cyber weapons don't take state actors and where because of climate change migration, which looks to displace hundreds of millions of people in the decade ahead, you have a lot more people who will be much more disenfranchised who also have much more access to do something about that that is catastrophic. So the world's fragile for all of these reasons. So our basic premise is um, we are in a phase where, and they're all the result of human technology and the coordination systems because Stone Age people just really can't cause biological crisis at a planetary level, nor can they cause war that messes everything up, nor even externalities that mess everything up. So it really is the result of technology and coordination failures of managing the technology. We're not going to regress to a low technology civilization. So we have to get the coordination down where we don't cause uh, excessive externalities in the process of our technology. And that, so that's solving the kind of mistake problems. And so that we don't use our technology rivalrously, i.e. exponential warfare towards each other. You could say all of the problems are the result of harm that we cause intentionally, so conflict theory, and harm we cause accidentally, so kind of mistake theory. And so, but both mediated by our degree of technological power. So at the level of coordination, we have to both work on resolving underlying sources of conflict and get better at anticipating externalities and mistakes and being able to internalize those. Um, your work through Club of Rome obviously looks at things like the limits of growth and uh, how does a civilization that has an exponential growth requirement on the financial system, where each of those dollars are bound to a materials economy in some ways on a finite planet, keep running forever? And then also your work through integral investing saying, insofar as most of the dollars that represent choices in the world are still moving through the market, uh, can we think about how we allocate those dollars better? It, we're not just looking like GDP by itself isn't a good metric because obviously... We know why we thought GDP was a good metric, but GDP goes up during war and with addiction and health issues and lots of things. In the same way, lowering CO2 by itself isn't a good metric because I could lower CO2 by planting a bunch of plants using more nitrogen fertilizers that cause runoff that cause dead zones and oceans faster. We need a complex set of metrics that we look at and indices we look at so in a growth framework. Um, so in the entire meta crisis, they're basically the framework we're proposing is that all of those catastrophes are design constraints that humanity must meet to have a civilization that continues. So if we take them all as design constraints and that simultaneously, we don't want the solution to the catastrophes to be control mechanisms that are so centralized that they create dystopias. So we want to avoid catastrophes and avoid dystopias. So our focus, you know, the kind of think tank that we run, our focus is how do we create a third attractor that is neither catastrophes, neither dystopias? What is a necessary and sufficient set of solutions to get there? And that's a huge topic and a lot of things are involved. Um, and so the reason I'm interested in Gerard's work and the work of uh, Metals Co, and we've been friends for some time now, why I thought it'd be an interesting conversation for you guys to have, and I was happy to join it, is the... Obviously, climate change is one of the major environmental issues we're facing. It's um, it's a particularly hard one because if we look at HFCs or CFCs causing ozone issues, <clears throat> or if we look at fluorinated surfactants used for um, uh, you know water proofing things or whatever, you can or pesticides you can potentially change that. You have to fight uphill against a multi billion dollar vested industry, but you don't have to fight uphill against industry itself. Whereas when CO2 is the byproduct of burning hydrocarbons, every single industry requires energy. And the transition of the energy process itself is more fundamental and deep than any particular area. So it's huge. Either we figure out how to 
transition off hydrocarbons and produce enough energy well, or we have massive problems. The transition off of hydrocarbons is not trivial because if we make solar cells and the associated battery packs to deal with intermittency or whatever else, it takes a lot of hydrocarbons to make those. And it, that thing has to run for 10 years or whatever it is to pay that off based. So the energy return on energy investment. So there's a lot of deep issues there. I have a series with Nate Hagens where we talk about those things in depth. So I, I won't get into them in too much depth here, but I will say that there is a very tight correlation between global GDP and global energy use. It's been referred to as the Garrett relation. There are some critiques of that specific formulation, but from 1970 till now, there's about a 99% correlation between global GDP and global energy use where all the efficiencies in technology give you about 1% more dollar per joule per year. But that 1% increase in efficiency doesn't change the fact that you still have exponential increase in demand to deal with the 3% global interest rate on the finance supply. So there's an embedded growth obligation on, on finance to just even be able to keep up with interest, let alone quantitative easing or anything else. That means that there's an embedded growth obligation on the total amount of energy. And that doesn't mean we just have to be able to keep up the amount of energy we have. It means we have to be able to grow the amount of energy. Obviously, that doesn't get to happen forever. We have a finite planet, so we're going to have to change the whole global financial system. That's a huge topic and beyond the scope of this. But the transition, so either the work to transition off hydrocarbons is hard, right? And we're talking about a world that has increasing energy demands. If you try to talk about lowering energy demands, you also talk about lowering GDP. That has been the stable post-World War II of how we avoid World War III. That was a huge part of the post-World War II system, the Bretton Woods system, is because we can make this global financial system and we can um, exponentiate the monetary supply, all the countries can have more stuff. They can all have their own growth imperative without taking each other's stuff. As soon as you start to get to a degrowth situation, you have some real hard geopolitics to deal with. You have some real hard that hitting the poor world more than the rich world, or you're trying to do redistribution by force, which like all the issues suck. So while we deal with some of those deeper issues of the embedded growth obligation on finance, we obviously can't keep doing the hydrocarbon thing for very long. If you have an entire world system that has been running on hydrocarbons, both um, oil and coal and natural gas, that means you have pipelines and you have internal combustion engines. You have an entire infrastructure built on that. If you want to get off that, you have to build a whole new infrastructure. You're talking about electric motors and batteries rather than internal combustion and gas. You're talking about electrification of the energy grid and storage for intermittency. So one of the issues becomes that for environmental reasons, we want to get off hydrocarbons, but there are environmental things that there are things that have environmental costs to do that, like the metals needed to make all those batteries and the resources to make the solar cells and the wind plants, whatever come from somewhere. Not only does it take some hydrocarbon energy to do it, but you actually have to take, you have to have real metals and real other resources to do that thing. And so <clears throat> if we look at the need to get off hydrocarbon fuels, combined with the need, the inability to lower the energy demand significantly. Even if we did all the efficiency measures, we're not going to lower it significantly because of all the geopolitical forcing functions. Then what are the rate limiting issues that often aren't addressed? One of them is that to electrify the entire transportation fleet is a big deal. The transportation fleet now doesn't only produce greenhouse gases. It also is the number one cause of particulate emissions and WHO estimates that maybe air pollution is the number one leading cause of death as a source of partial attribution worldwide. They recently said that they anticipated that chemical pollution in the atmosphere, including particulate pollution from internal combustion, would be the uh, uh, greater killer than climate change in the decade to come. So it's like when we're talking about internal combustion, we're talking about problems of oil spills and wars over oil and political destabilization that's associated with it, as well as CO2, as well as um, particulate emission and all these types of things. So it's not a monofocus and very much ocean health, obviously, both because of warming and because of ocean acidification, uh, climate change has a massive effect on oceans. Um, so if you want the batteries for electrifying all of the transport and then the energy storage that is needed for the electrification of the grid from things that have intermittency, where do all those minerals come from? The mining of those minerals from surface sources environmentally has real problems because a lot of those surface sources are um, uh, 
areas that have some of the last remaining critical biodiversity. Uh, a lot of the uh, ore sources have a lot of unusable co-product that turns into toxic waste and is a major source of problem for freshwater planetary boundaries, which are one of the major ones to hit. So when I met Gerard and heard about their solution, which I'll let him share, there were a number of things about it that even though it has some environmental cost, looking at the entire life cycle of all of the environmental costs and the trade-offs that we can't avoid because there are very hard trade-offs that humanity has to face, seems like it is an important and critical topic to get a lot more serious attention. And that's why I um, wanted to have the conversation. Well, brilliant. So, um, Gerard, you are the CEO, founder, you're a serial entrepreneur, first of all, this is where we connected to, uh, and you are the CEO and the founder of The Metals Company. And uh, so tell us, uh, you know, tell us, why why go the hard way? You're right, Mariana, it is the hard way, because getting a new extractive industry uh, established at a time where the world is focused on the impact of all extractive industries is, well, it's a little counterintuitive. And so what we did is we looked at, you know, accepting the fact that the world is going to need a lot more metal. And I think that is un indisputable. If we look at the International Energy Agency, you know, they say by 2040, we'll need between five and 600% more of these metals to meet the energy needs for the, the transition. So accepting that fact, then we put through the lens of, well, where, where can they come from? You know, where is the right place to be looking for these metals and with the lightest planetary and human touch? And we came to the conclusion that the, the absolute winner in that race was these, uh, like I have in my hand, and this being a polymetallic nodule. And of course, we know that 70% of the planet is covered in ocean. And, and this is why it was so interesting to, to blend your integral thinking into this, because we can't look at the ocean without looking at land impacts. And we can't be looking at land impacts without looking at the entire impact of, to our planet. And so what we started our work on was identifying you know, what are the impacts of collecting this resource and turning it into battery metals? And if you if you go back to our purpose, which we published many years ago, it came in three steps. And one was to identify where are the lowest impact supply of these battery metals to be found. And we decided that this was the resource to investigate further. And, and because we don't have enough metals in the system to allow a pathway to circularity, because we do believe that circularity in the long run will reduce the demand for virgin ores. And so that's where we need to get to. So, but step one was to get the lowest impact from a planetary, environmental, and human perspective of supply of these metals into the system. And step two of our purpose was then to make sure every single atom that we put into the system stayed there. And Daniel coined the phase, uh, phrase uh, atoms as a service, meaning let's put the metals in there, but let's make sure we get them back and we can recycle them and, and, um, and make sure that they can stay there for many millions of years to come. And then finally, when extractive industries uh, slow down because stage two has been so successful and we are in a circular economy to make sure that we can repurpose our land-based infrastructure to recycle other materials because these nodules are abundant in nickel, which is a really important metal for our future, uh, copper, cobalt, and manganese. But of course, there are many other metals that don't have the same, um, well, aren't, fo aren't the focus of recycling at the moment, but they will be as we head towards circularity. So that's where we started. And the, the beauty when we look at this ore body, um, and, and the reason why, it's a little bit, it takes a bit of adjustment is, is of course, you know, if you look at 70% of the planet is ocean and the abyssal zone is by far the most common environment on our planet. It's an area at about almost 4,000 meters and beyond below seawater. And this is where these nodules lie. And they literally form by precipitating the metals that are in the seawater or the sediment upon which they sit. 
So they grow a little bit like a pearl grows by precipitating those metals. And, and the beauty of that, of course, is that we, when we move them to shore to process them, um, we kind of reverse that process uh, and we can turn 100% of the mass of this nodule in my hand into usable, saleable material. And that means we generate no waste, like zero waste and zero tailings. And that's a real game changer for the mining and metals industry because last year about um, 190 billion tons of waste was generated by the mining industry globally. And put that in context, about 2 billion tons of waste was generated municipally globally. So waste is a really important problem. And if you're going to increase that by five or six X, then it's an even bigger problem. But Mother Nature did us a, a, an amazing thing by where they located these nodules in the abyssal zone. And they literally just lie there on the ocean floor. And so to extract them, it means we have to pick them up off the surface. And we've just completed a very uh, important set of trials. Um, our company has been around for uh, around 12 years, um, but we're working towards the permit to be able to move from exploration phase to extraction phase. And so an important part of that were some trials that we completed last year where we had our first production system on our license area so we could we could test our, our production means by which we lift these nodules, um, pump them to the production vessel, and then we'll move them ashore for processing to turn them into battery metals. Um, but what we were very encouraged by was um, we had two vessels. One was a 240 meter uh, production vessel known as the Hidden Gem. And it was uh, it was the one that drove the robot on the seafloor. And, um, and it was engineered by one of our big investors and partners, Allseas, who have uh, for the last 37 years been um, very successful in the pipeline industry for the oil and gas world. And, and so a lot of expertise from that industry is coming to help us move this industry past the experimental phase into the production phase. And, um, and they did an amazing job and it was a, a wildly successful campaign. So we're very relieved and pleased about that. But we had a second vessel out there and it was science focused. We had many scientists on the hidden gem as well, but but that second vessel was purely there for monitoring. And so we were surveying the area before we touched it, uh, during the uh, collection phase, and then post the collection phase. And, you know, that was an important part because the results of that work will go into our application that we plan to submit to the the regulator, who is the International Seabed Authority, um, and will be an important part of the environmental impact study uh, to look at the impact of picking these up. And, and I'm pleased to say, um, you know, the things that we worry about are, are, you know, well, what's the impact of removing them on biodiversity? You know, will there be uh, loss and how do we mitigate that? What will, will be the impact of the, the dust that we generate on the seafloor? People know it as the plume. Uh, how can we mitigate that? How far will it travel? Think of it as driving a car down a dirt road. You'll you'll kick up some dust, but how far will that dust travel? And then the third thing is where to re-inject the, um, uh, the water that we bring up from the seafloor, because we separate the sediment from the nodules at the robot, but we have to use water to as the transport mechanism, and then we have to return that water somewhere. Um, but if I was to, to, to put that into two categories, you're talking about biodiversity and you're talking about plume. And, you know, speculation by some people was that this plume would travel for large distances and would have a, you know, a, a negative impact on the surroundings of the ocean as thousands of miles away. But our results were very consistent with the results that MIT published some months ago um, from a, a very extensive campaign that they were monitoring a year earlier. And that is that the plume only rose about two meters above the seafloor. And most of it, like up to 98% of it, stayed in the, the test area. And so that's good news. And it was what we always believed. But of course, science has to provide the evidence uh, to be able to make these decisions. 
So now, of course, we have uh, a, a, we've been gathering this environmental data, including baseline data, for many, many years. And so now the job is to put all of the results of that um, into a coherent uh, study and put uh, to extrapolate those results into more of a production type environment as well. And then to submit that as part of our application to move from exploration into a phase that we're, we're, we're able to lift the nodules and move them to shore and process them and, and sell the results. And, and so, you know, we've always believed that we can compress the range of impacts by uh, very significant amounts. And we've been funding a lot of uh, research to that point. We uh, have had many articles appear in peer reviewed journals, like the, the, the Journal of Cleaner Production that published our CO2 paper that said showed that you can reduce CO2 emissions by more than 90% when you build a battery cathode using these rocks compared to the land-based alternatives. Um, the fact that we can generate no waste, you know, the fact that we we will uh, reduce the amount of water required, fresh water, by 90% when we process nodules compared to land-based ores. The fact that we don't need to move indigenous communities, um, and that's one of the really big focuses, particularly for the nickel product. I, I mentioned nickel is very important. About half of the economics come from nickel. And if you look at the supply of nickel globally, it's declining. The growth in nickel is coming from Indonesia, and that's in the form of these nickel laterites. And so, you know, you can see a green picture behind me on the wall, or it's actually a, a moss wall. But imagine that is a, uh, a very biodiverse rainforest in Indonesia. Um, and under it lies a lot of nickel. So to get to that nickel, you've got to build a heap of infrastructure. You've got to go in and tear down the rainforest and move all the topsoil, all of which, of course, means destroying carbon sinks. Uh, you then need to, to dig up this uh, nickel laterite ore. Unfortunately, when you expose it to weather, the runoff is chromium 6+, which, of course, poisons everything in its path. And then you're doing all of that looking for like one to 2% of the material is usable. The other 90 plus percent of it is waste and you have to do something with that waste. And it's not just any old waste, it's toxic waste. So you can't, you know, you have to treat it and manage it. And um, so, you know, the, it's a horrible situation we find ourselves in. And that's why we have to be looking at new frontiers because turning a blind eye to the current practices is not a viable alternative. You know, we have to be, working with full knowledge and and you know you can't pretend that the batteries in your electric car are made with sustainable metals you can't just think oh yeah i don't have to worry about that as as citizens of our planet we do have to worry about it and we have to be looking through the lens of you know a full life cycle analysis and say well what are what are these set of broad impacts and how do they compare to the alternatives and then we have some judgments to make you know, and the judgments are, do we want to keep destroying the most biodiverse carbon sinks on our planet, you know, robbing indigenous communities, pushing them out of their home habitats. Also, we can, you know, just meet the insatiable demand for the energy transition. Or do we want to think a bit harder about this and, and look for something that is a whole lot, you know, better for our planet and for the humans living on it? Wow, thank you so much. And, you know, I want to summarize some of those things and ask you some further questions, because I think what you're doing is really pioneering work, and it's really important. So just first for location, um, if I understand it correctly, this is in the in the waters of the Republic of Nauru, is that correct? No, no, we're actually in international waters. And oh, so good. Nauru is our public, is our sponsor, because... Right. Uh, we wind our mind back 50 years ago. This industry almost got started. Um, there were mm -hmm. four different consortiums involving Lockheed Martin and Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, uh, BP and Shell were involved. And they started to put um, efforts together to collect these rocks. And they were successful. It, it was really pioneering stuff. I mean, we've just had a very successful trial, but we've benefited from the development of the offshore industry and all the engineering advancement in the last 50 years. But 50 years ago, 
they built the system and the robots to go down and hoover these up. And um, Rio Tinto built a processing plant on shore, and it was all successful. But, but the problem is, 50 years ago, the world had not agreed who owned the oceans. Where do my borders begin and end? Yes. And so it was when Henry Kissinger wrote a letter to all of the ambassadors of the uh, UN saying, uh, we'd like to lay claim over this area. Uh, it'll be good for the world. Trust us on that. Of course, all the ambassadors got together and said, uh, that doesn't sound... Uh, too equitable. Uh, and, and so the UN stopped it. They, so everyone had to pause. And then that was agreed uh, finally on where the borders begin and end when UNCLOS, which stands for the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, um, was put into place in 1982. And that basically said, as a sovereign, you own everything within 12 miles of your coastline, and you have an economic right to everything within 200 miles. But beyond that, it's not yours. In fact, it's everybody's. It's deemed the common heritage of humankind, and it will be governed by the International Seabed Authority. And so we are in international waters. But but to be able to claim an area, you either need to be a signatory to UNCLOS and a member of the International Seabed Authority, which we are not, or be sponsored by a member. And of course, they really wanted developing countries to be involved because typically, it's the wealthy nations who have the resources and the expertise um, to be able to, you know, lead the charge. Yet the poor developing countries, you know, are left out wondering, well, what happened there? Whereas this is a way that a developing nation, in our case, Nauru, um, we also have a similar relationship with the kingdom of Tonga and Kiribati. But this is a way that those developing countries who've had zero contribution to climate change, Who've, who've done nothing about helping perpetuate this climate crisis that we're in, but allows them to participate and to be able to learn new skills, to create jobs, to earn royalties, of course, and also play an important part in, in providing one of the important solutions. So we're about a thousand miles off the coast of Mexico. And so it's a long way from anything. Um, but proximity to Nauru is, is not one of the criteria. We, we could have equally had um, a, one of the African countries sponsor our application or, or. I'm really glad you clarified that, especially because I'm calling from the Republic of Mauritius. So here it's also a small island developing state. And I think what you're bringing up here is, is very important geopolitically, but also in terms of the socioeconomic inequalities in, in addressing this. And so I have a few more <laughs> small questions so that everyone who's listening is really getting the fuller picture here. But you addressed many of the key issues around an environmental impact assessment with the EIA. Um, there's also the impact of sound uh, in terms of the impact for the whales and for the dolphins. So I'd love to hear your views on that as well. And then I'd really love to hear from you whether you took the compliance route of complying with regulations or you took the corporate sustainability leadership route of saying, look, we're not just looking only to comply with what's expected in order to get a license, but we're actually advocating for higher standards. And we're really willing to use ourselves here as a case study to then educate and inform others of how we can do this in a way that is regenerative and at the least amount of impact with that bigger planetary vision that you, you know, described so well. No, great questions. Uh, on the topic of sound, you know, we've run a very extensive sound uh, campaign with our trials that have just recently completed. And so we uh, we look forward to publishing the results. Um, early indications are that they're all very manageable. Um, most of the sound, of course, happens on the surface. Um, but there is, you know, there's noise generated by the transportation of nodules up the pipe and but there are there are there are means that we can dampen that noise substantially if required but as it stands now uh, we're very encouraged by the results that we've seen from those recent trials and so we, we don't think noise just just remember we're not breaking anything on the seafloor like these nodules literally lie there so it's not as though we're having to drill or blast which is conventionally what happens you know, in the oil and gas or the mining industry. And so, you know, very different scenario. Um, so going back on to the path that we took, I think it's really important for people to understand 
one thing. Never before has an industry had so much focus before it got started by a regulator. Like normally industries get started and then people try and regulate them. So here we are, the International Seabed Authority is made up of 167 member countries plus the European Union. It's been established since 1994. Like if you, if you were, I don't know, Greenpeace and you had to imagine had to imagine a, a regulatory environment, I, I imagine you'd probably say it's something like this. Now, of course, they'll probably say it's not quite good enough but today, but, but never before has an industry had so much focus before it's got started. So that's encouraging. But the other thing I'd like to make the point of is that don't think if it doesn't happen under the control of the regulator, the International Seabed Authority, don't think these assets won't be exploited. And that's the opportunity for the world today. The fact that you've got a regulator in place and the fact that you've got a company like ourselves, I'd like to say we're a really responsible corporate citizen. We, we've There are guidelines that have been laid down by the regulator on what we should be looking at from an environmental perspective um, management perspective, because the mandate of the International Seabed Authority is really clear. It's to put in place exploration and exploitation regulations, a, a term that's adopted from the land-based mining industry, while protecting the marine environment. And so we they provide very strong guidance on what should happen. But we always said, we actually want to see that and up at another level. And the good news there is that when you set a standard, then generally that becomes a level that people have to attain or exceed. And so I think it's really a positive thing that A, we have a regulator, that everyone's playing by the rule book at the moment. And secondly, that companies like us are, are striving towards excellence. You know, when we put together our environmental um, plan, we didn't go and hire a heap of scientists so it could be company prepared. We went and sought the very best experts from each discipline. And so we have, you know, if you go to our website, you'll see the array of institutions and universities. We have you know, MIT helping us. We have the University of Hawaii. We have the National Oceanography Center, the Natural History Museum. It's a really broad range of leading institutions who have, have put their expertise. And with the help of our money, I mean, by the time we complete this, we will have spent uh, over $100 million. I mean, it's a lot of money we've invested in this. It's the largest fully integrated, you know, ocean research research program ever done. And so, you know, we did that because we 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 knew that people would say, ah, oh, yeah, but you did it, the metals company. Whereas we can say, oh, hang on, you know, we bought expertise in from all of these very upstanding institutions who, um, you know, have done the work independently. They're free to publish their results. You know, we don't put any handcuffs on anyone. We now have the CSIRO and uh, the equivalent agency in New Zealand working with us on putting together an adaptive management plan. And, and that's gonna be exciting too, because their recently completed work uh, on the Great Barrier Reef is there for everyone to see. It's amazing the rehabilitation that is happening because there's so many things to worry about, but what are the important things to worry about? And so, you know, what CSIRO and 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 the, the equivalent agency in New Zealand are helping us with is, is deciding what are the things to measure? What are the, the boundaries that we need to be mindful of as we move through the production process? So, so I'd like to think, um, you know, we took a set of guiding principles and we improved on them. And, you know, knowing that we're going to have the eyes of the world focused on us, which is something we're very, very comfortable with. And, and you know, th that adaptive management system, we, we, we pair it with our digital twin because I sometimes hear people say, well, how on earth will we know what you're doing? A thousand miles offshore, 4,000 meters below sea level. We won't know what's going on there, but but it's ex the exact opposite. I don't know whether you've ever tried to get near a land-based mine, but it's impossible. 
you met with barbed wire and machine guns, depending which country you're in. Um, whereas we want to let people, including the regulator, have eyes and ears to exactly what we're doing. So people can see the low level of impact that's being generated. And so it's a different approach. So now that, that we address the, the environmental issues and, you know, we know what we're talking about, our listeners are the target audience, are investors. And uh, so this is your floor. What do you need from investors? How can we support your work moving forward? Thank you. I, I see Daniel wanting to, to interject, but. Daniel? So, there were a handful of environmental topics you touched on that I just think are important to take one step further before we get into uh, the business case, if you don't mind. So Gerard was just recently mentioning coral and obviously the coral bleaching and uh, die-off issues and how critical coral are to life in the oceans is a topic everyone's aware of. Um, one of the, other than Great Barrier Reef, one of the major centers of coral in the world is off the coast of Indonesia, which is the other place that the nickel can come. And when Gerard was saying that 90 plus percent of the ore that gets extracted is a waste product, and most of that being a toxic waste product, the waterways that that goes into, if the um, mining tailing dams break, which happens all the time, like just look into um, <clears throat> mining pollution toxicity, mining tailing uh, dams breaking, just you do a bit of the study he was mentioning, you know, 190 billion tons of waste from mining compared to, you know, municipal waste at a couple billion tons. This is not just looking at that being a generally toxic issue, but specifically in, in Indonesia, where both the tropical rainforest on the surface and the um, end of the waterway where the waste would end up going are one of the most uh, biodiverse on surface and land areas in the world. So that's just a really critical thing to, you know, think of, think about. Um, we know that when we're talking about fracking or tar sands, it's because the really easy oil has already been mostly used up. Uh, nobody would go drill offshore for oil if there was easy oil onshore. Nobody would do fracking or tar sands, but you use up the easy stuff and then you get into diminishing returns. We're in diminishing returns in hydrocarbons, which is why we're doing that stuff, which is another reason we have to switch energy sources quickly. Um, but we're also in diminishing returns on so many sources of metals where the highest grade ores that were closest to the surface got used up, that were easiest to get to. The ones that are left are lower grade ore, which means more toxicity or in much harder to get to areas, which means having to penetrate deeper into big rainforests and it's not simply the impact, <clears throat> let's say we're talking about going into Indonesia or into the Amazon for mining assets. Uh, it's not simply how much of the rainforest has to be destroyed for the road in and the mine. Um, I was talking to some environmental scientists who are working on planetary boundaries and we're looking at biodiversity writ large, doing meta-analysis on all the biodiversity metrics. They said that the single most critical factor that they have found for biodiversity in terms of if there was one thing that was going to damage biodiversity the most, it's the first road that enters into an otherwise large virgin area because there is a high initial cost to develop the first road and the initial infrastructure. Once that's developed for some purpose, there's a lower barrier of entry to be able to go in for other purposes that don't have quite as high a margin. So you can go in for logging and go in for animal agriculture and other things like that once that's developed, but the initial one will usually be developed for mining or for oil or gas or something that has a much higher price point. So it's not only when you're looking at um, how much carbon is re released and how much carbon sink um, is damaged in the process of destroying that surface rainforest and the biodiversity, but how much that opens up in terms of all the other industries, that's a really critical topic. And in this particular situation, you don't have a similar thing because the Seabed Authority is not regulating all sea mining as the same thing. They're all very different, and there aren't a lot of other uses for the seafloor that once you open it up now, people want to go start taking all the other stuff. There's not there's silt, right? Like there's silt, and then there happens to be these nodules. That's another point that I wanted to open up is that um, the regulation being proposed in Metals Coast position is not pro-ocean mining. It's a much more nuanced thing that says uh, pro-collection of these polymetallic nodules that happen to be 
not just profitable metals, but key metals for the energy transition off of hydrocarbons, that is a critical thing that are also relatively low impact, both because they're in an area that has low biodiversity, they're in an area where that same biodiversity is indexed in areas that won't be mined or affected, and where they don't actually have to go into the crust or do any kind of drilling or cutting. There are lots of other types of ocean mining where the cost benefit environmentally doesn't make sense. It makes sense to do surface mining or to really avoid that source as a whole. So when you say ocean mining as a binary, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's like saying, are you pro or anti AI? Well, it depends on the application. There's really terrible applications. Are you pro or anti synthetic bio? It depends on the application. So <clears throat> that's just another topic I wanted to bring up. It, and the last one is when I was a young environmentalist and I would hear about something like mine the oceans, that term would just freak me out, right? Or like mine the rainforest or, and I didn't have the sense that the, the TV that I was seeing that ad on or the computer or phone now that I'm seeing it on requires a whole bunch of fucking metals that communicate over satellites fueled by a lot of energy that came from a supply chain that comes from somewhere mm -hmm. and what the trade-offs associated are. And so uh, the binary of should we mine the oceans or not mine the oceans, if we could just say, yes, let's just not, and there was no alternative, you know, all negative thing that would happen, of course, that would be like, yes, let's just not. But if it is selective, highly regulated mining of a certain type in a certain area for certain purposes, or if not doing that, then you have one of a couple options. So you don't get the metals that are needed for the batteries and either now you have to get them from the surface sources. And now you're dealing with look at what the surface sources for the nickel, cobalt, manganese, et cetera, are, and look at the fact that they are largely things that produce much more toxic waste than the nodules do. They have to have more effects on surface biodiversity um, and in more biodiversity critical zones of the world. Or you say, well, let's just not have batteries and let's keep all the particulate transmission and the CO2. And so then you can make a makeup answer called, let's just need less energy. Well, that's cute, but that's just not going to happen unless you get rid of a lot of humans um, or want the war that goes along with that. And so if you really take the trade-offs and say, until someone can present how to radically degrow GDP and, and or radically decrease energy without needing to decrease GDP, neither one of which have real viable solutions in the short term, then that energy has to come from somewhere. And if you want to get off hydrocarbons, then where do those metals come from? Those are real questions. And so I want the best environmental answers for that. I'm willing for them to not be the best economic answers. They just have to be viable enough that the people motivated by the economics are not motivated to go to war otherwise, because of course, poor economics can mean disproportionate harm to poor people. It can mean uh, a, a basis for war over resources. <clears throat> um, but what I would want the environmental um, scientists and environmental groups and thinkers to do is to say, okay, let's really look at the entire trade-off space clearly and well and let's make sure that we, if we're going to object to something, that we have a comprehensively better proposal that we actually know how to enact. If our better proposal has no enactability, like let's just decrease the total amount of energy the world needs by a lot, that's not actually a solution. So from what I can tell, and I would change my position on this if anyone presented something better, there is no realistic way to decrease the energy demands, and there is no realistic way to get off hydrocarbon without increasing the metal demands. And given that, we're looking at the trade-offs between sourcing, none of which are perfect, but in this particular situation seem quite clear for some of the base models. What a beautiful way to summarize uh, what has been said and also from an integral perspective. So I really appreciate that, particularly uh, because you know, we need to make sure that we don't look in a naive way. Um, into what needs to happen next and so those blind spots have to be addressed and um thank you um Gerard I mean 
the reason why I went into the cost and uh, the investor, the financial support uh, was because I truly see that, um, that you're doing at least as far as humanly possible uh, in our culture. And so within having said that, and thank you for the summary, Daniel, I think uh, I'd like to know next from you, Gerard, how can we, those of us who have financial means and focus on that, support your work, given the fact that you are so integrally uh, mm. looking at addressing those issues. Thank you. Thank you. So so we're really about building a community that supports this movement. <laughs> and, you know, I was... I always enjoy any opportunity to be on a, a medium with Daniel because he really does tap into a, a set of thinkers who are prepared to think a little bit, you know, deeper into the, the true issues and have a trade-off conversation. And and obviously adding integral thinking into, you know, this and that, being able to access that community, I, I see is really you know, important as we try and find people that want to come and put their shoulder to the wheel. Because as Daniel said, you know, it's complex. And also, you know, as as he said, at the moment, this seems to be the best solution. And it's something we always said to our stakeholders, you know, if we we have a we have a a, a set of requirements that we see as need to be met. To keep going on this and one of them is making sure that we do satisfy the requirement to not harm the environment you know there's nothing that has zero harm but but if we found that this ecosystem you know would be damaged such that it changed the function of the oceans then we would have some stop moments we'd be like oh sorry guys um, we've got new information that needs us to to pivot to a new, look for a new extractive, uh, new supply to these important metals. But so far, all of the news is encouraging on that. So we feel confident. But what we really need are people who want to come and join us on this story. And, and that includes people like you, Mariana, who, who are prepared to access your network to help us communicate this important story. Um, we obviously, uh, we're a public company now. We're listed on the NASDAQ. Our ticker is TMC for the metals company. Um, we've had a pretty rough ride. I got to tell you, it's been a, a, a hellish ride as a public company. Um, you know, as a private company, we'd raised money at about a $2 billion valuation. And then we we became a $3 billion company. But today we're a or a fraction of that. Yet we have a really sticky, solid register. You know, we just raised more money recently, and that mainly came from internal shareholders. Um, so, we, you know, we feel confident about our financial future. And, and all of this, the decreasing value of TMC, the public company, is at a time when our assets, our licenses are becoming more and more valuable. You know, the first area that we're developing is Nori Area D. And that represents about 22% of our uh, defined resource because we've we've already um, identified about 1.6 billion tons of these on two of our license areas, and so we're we're compliant with the Canadian Resource Reporting Standard. And the resource certainty is really high because they're two-dimensional; they lie on the ocean floor, so you can see them. Um, but the the economics for that first block, Nori Area D, that's 22% of our defined resource, has a net present value today of more than $15 billion. You know, and, and if we were a land-based project at the same stage of development, the value of our company would be between about 0.2 and 0.7 times that NAV. So 0.2 or 0.7 times $15 billion. Yet our value is not that, it's it's more like, it's like 0.01% of the NAV. And so a bit more than that, but 0.015. So that seems wrong. So there's a disconnect, um, you know, and, and about 60% of the register is really sticky, like people like myself and all C's and our largest shareholder from uh, San Francisco, a family office who've been, you know, so really committed people 
who are not looking at this as a, a trade to make money. They, they, they're in this for the long term. And so what we really want to do is to get more people to come and join us on this journey, to buy the shares, to share us into their community such that we can, you know, have discussions like this so we can find people who have a willingness to come and learn more and to come and support this new industry. And it's very rare that you can be at the beginning of a new industry, but that's where we are. Like, and this is a really exciting time because, you know, it's, it's one analogy is, you know, offshore oil and gas. Once upon a time, there was no offshore oil and gas. And then in the blink of an eye, 30% of oil and gas supplies came offshore. I think it could be even more aggressive when it comes to uh, these metals, when it comes to nickel and cobalt and manganese, that more more supply could come out of the ocean. So I'm I'm very encouraged by that. So, um, so yeah, that's, I think there are many, many different ways. And, um, you know, I think, getting people to buy the stock and getting people to to talk about the story and to come and be inquisitive and and to want to learn more and allow us to to talk to their networks um, important networks of of thinkers uh, is the areas that can help us most we are talking to a broad range of strategic partners now because one of the ways companies like ours finance their future activities is by inviting other companies to come and invest at the asset. So not into our top co, because obviously we think the stock is hugely devalued. Um, so we don't want to be issuing more shares. What we want to do is to unlock some of that $15 billion of net present value. And so, you know, I mentioned at our last earnings call that we're talking to a variety of strategic names um, about earning into those assets. And and that's a way that, you know, we can avoid dilution, uh, invite strategic names in who can help us with capital and expertise as needed to start developing these important assets. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Gerard. And, you know, as an investor, I know how values uh, decrease like that. And I uh, I can only imagine, you know, what you've been going through over the past uh, 12 years. But Daniel had a question that uh, goes in that direction. Daniel, why don't you? Yeah, just in, in case it's not obvious, do you want to say why you believe the stock value went down? Because obviously, if you're asking people to invest, it's based on the idea that the stock value is going to go up. And in addition to investment, what else would create a turnaround in that? Yeah, most certainly. Um, look, uh, the, the the main issue that people have about, you know, our valuation is the fact that the final regulations have not been adopted yet. So at the moment, we have exploration licenses and the uh, that allows us to apply for an exploitation license over those same defined areas and so so if you like we've been busy putting the cart beside the horse along the way um maybe even in front of the horse sometimes but the final exploitation code is due to be adopted later this year and that is they are the rules that will allow us to then submit our application and move from exploration to extraction phase. And so obviously the moment that happens, that massively opens up the value of those assets. We we already have our first production asset, the hidden gem. So the boat that we were out uh, on our license area with last year that was um, owned and operated by All Seas will also be our first production asset when once we receive the commercial permit to move ahead. And so I think that's the main gating item. Now, of course, there were some other things when we became a public company, you know, we had, you know, a short report came out, we had a funding shortfall, one of the major investors who'd committed to investing um, uh, went bankrupt. And so that was a problem for us. Um, we, We went public via a merger with a SPAC which in 2020 was all the rage. Uh, when we announced our deal on March 4, 2021, we were kind of the last SPAC to get through the gates. 
And the SEC really turned their focus on SPACs because there are a lot of crazy businesses that went public uh, through SPACs. You know, I would never invest in them because they weren't underwritten by tangible assets. You know, they were they were pipe dreams. Um, so that meant we went public thinking we were going to raise about six hundred million dollars, but the redemption rate of our SPAC went from you know low single digits in the year 2020 all of a sudden in 2021 redemption rates went back to normal which were very very high so a lot of the money that we thought we were raising uh either redeemed or in the case of our defaulting investor defaulted so it meant we raised 137 million dollars instead of 600 so that meant you know that was a real you know kick in the teeth and we had to decide well what do we do do we do we proceed and remain a private company or do we proceed and become a public company we decided to stay on the public path we um it provided us enough money to keep the program on track and and amazingly thank you to an amazing team we've kept the program on track so we still are committed to first production at the end of 2024 now we're at the beginning of 2023 so at the end of next year we for some reason we lost Gerard. I see that. So while he was uh, describing uh, his uh, challenges with uh, with uh, you know a startup, I could only refer to or think back to. Uh, what we experienced with the energy turnaround startup. And I originally wanted to have uh, the, uh, you know, co-founder be with us uh, because he would have brought a different, um, you know, regulatory aspect from an industry that is just, you know, starting to uh, get involved and in how the current regulators are basically um, doing everything and anything to prevent you from, uh, from being successful. So uh, Gerard actually uh, elaborated that. So as a, as a serial entrepreneur, as an, an investor for more than 30 years, I, I so can sympathize with what Gerard has been going to through. And, you know, I know um, if I remember correctly, you invested several uh, tens of millions of your own money into this company because you believe in it. And that's basically the best way, the best confirmation for investors. If uh, the founder, you know, puts um, all of his uh, eggs into one basket, uh, then that's the way to go. And uh, so I can only encourage everyone and anyone to who is listening to this to really uh, join forces with us. So Aniluz, uh, Daniel, uh, do you have any more questions for uh, for Gerard? I had one quick thing I was going to say is at one point Gerard said, um, don't think that the resources won't be uh, collected or exploited at some point through some process um the orientation for growth and the need of the metals and growth seems and the you know mo nodules having a straightforward method to collect them that has only been legally hung up um and the market demand on those continuing to increase makes it seem really crystal clear that those will become a collected asset so then the question is, how environmentally well is it regulated? And let's say, you know, we already see people working on um, uh, geoengineering involving um, solar radiation, aerosols in the upper atmosphere that might have unbelievably huge environmental consequences out of a kind of like um, terror associated with climate change. When you start to get in really back against the wall positions, then you move forward in less conscious ways. And I can see the world moving forward in a less conscious way with regard to this when it becomes you know, critical that it's needed late. I would actually really rather have the regulatory pathway be quite strict. Like I would like very strict environmental regulation. I would like other submersibles down there that are monitoring the ocean quality and monitoring the plumes and monitoring the biodiversity and making sure everything is good, which means that I would like a company that is actually really invested in that, helping to open up the initial regulatory pathway that says, actually, we're not trying to talk you into using lobbying efforts 
uh, decreasing the regulatory standards. We actually want you to increase the regulatory standards so that then, whether it's the major Chinese mining companies or it's Lockheed or any of the other companies that might not have as much environmental uh, motivation themselves, they're actually both, they're now bound to do it by a regulatory process that has transparency. So um, there does seem to be an inevitability argument and then what is the best way to do it? It feels like an important part of this that I wanted to uh, also mention. Thank you, Daniel. And I'd like to um, also, uh, you know, give the word again to Gerard, who was cut off from, uh, you know, using this beautiful technology of the future from our conversation. So to finish his sentence uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the hard time that he went through and uh, how he would like to move forward and uh, how we can support him. No, thank you. Well, well, I was just finishing up saying that, you know, despite the uh, the headwinds, you know, we've kept a, a team very, very glued together around the mission. Like mission alignment is 10 out of 10 with our entire team. And, you know, in a very hot employment labor market, you know, we've been able to keep people in a really difficult, you know, difficult industry that's often under attack because they're so mission aligned with the importance of this. And, you know, it, it's also very exciting being part of a new industry. And and it takes a little bit of stubbornness and determination to be able to stay the course on this one when you have so many, you know, um, you know, hand grenades coming at you from different directions. But but you know, the prize is a big one from a planetary perspective. You know, of course, the fiscal stuff will work out work out for itself. We are operating in the for profit environment. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is, you know, the pace at which we have been able to complete our science. You know, we have been, you know, we've had boats on the water approaching nine hundred days now. You know, with the focus being science. And that's because we've had a, you know, we know how to develop commercial projects, but we've had a very integrated, privately funded science program, whereas a lot of these science programs tend to be funded by grants. A lot of the other contractors, you know, they'll do a campaign this year, another campaign a couple of years time. I mean, in 2020, we had our boat on the water four times. These were campaigns that ran six to eight weeks. In 2021, we had our, uh, we ran five campaigns, similar timeframes. So we've been really, really busy. Um, and we were able to really pin our ears back during COVID as well, because we'd raised some money privately and we were well funded. To, and we knew that it would be a, a, a challenging time, COVID. But we created this bubble, you know, and we didn't lose a single day through COVID. And we were able to achieve amazing progress. Um that allowed us to become, you know, to get through the public uh, company process. So, so look, it's a uh, it's a company that that I think you know will benefit by being exposed to you know this community. And so, I really thank you for giving me the opportunity of of talking today and to exposing the story to an important group of um, critical thinkers. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Iran. Also, Daniel for you know, really mapping out that complexity <laughs> that so often gets flattened. And Gerard, what really stood out for me in this conversation that you said, join us on the journey. Mm -hmm. um, that is also for, you know, essential for cultivating trust uh, because there's transparency and there's openness. So perhaps in closing, can you let us know some of the ways in which we can join you on the journey? I started already exploring your um, your Vimeo channel and going through the videos, which was really informative. Yeah, uh, other ways that we can join you on the journey. Mm. Well, I, I think we have a really rich um, resource center at our website at uh, metals.co. And if you go to the um, uh, to the the FAQs there, 
you'll see us address many of the things that are probably going to cross your mind. You know, the, the tricky questions about why we're doing this and, uh, and impacts and so on. And, you know, as you mentioned, we have a rich video library. We've, you know, we had uh, filmographers on the boats. You know, we, we always do because we really want to catalog this journey so people can at least feel they're part of it. Um, and so, you know, come up the knowledge curve, but we really need action as well. You know, it's if, if the result of this call is that everyone's a little bit better informed than I failed, I really need people to get involved. And how you can get involved is uh, send me an email at jared at metals.co, uh, buy the stock, um, think about your community that you can tell about this important story. You might have people that just you, you think could have their own platform that we could do a repeat session such as we're doing today if it can reach a broader audience. And I know that when Daniel first suggested Mariana to me, it was it, it was because of your work with uh, the integral uh, thinking. It was because of your work with Club of Rome and it was because of your network, you know, around the world that he really said, this is a really important session, Jared. And, 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 you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that because, you know, sometimes it feels like it's one conversation at a time, but obviously if that can lead to a thousand to a million, then that's the journey that I really need some help from people on. And, 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 you know, we're making tremendous progress on the project. As I mentioned, I think we're really well squared away there. Um, but this, the, the challenge of communicating this to the broader market and the investing community is something that clearly, look at our stock price, we haven't done well enough at. But the business that underlies it is, is in great shape and we feel very confident about the direction we're heading. We don't have all the answers yet, you know, and that's why we're spending the money. And, you know, we're, we're, we're moving ahead, I think, in a very precautionary sense, but with a commercial imperative because, you know, this this crisis is not something to think about. It's here. You know, we we really need to be taking uh, progressive steps to be dealing with it. And, you know, we tend to be, you know, we are solutions oriented and we, you know, we think this is going to be one of the most important um, answers, certainly to the metal crisis. And so, yeah. Danielle? One of the things I actually really like about this particular situation that I find interesting about it that almost all entrepreneurs would find infinitely frustrating is I like that it actually has to pass through a regulatory process that is looking at environmental and social and other forms of externality possibilities first, because that's actually something that I propose as necessary for all industries in the world moving forward to make it through the meta crisis. If you look at, <clears throat> Gerard was saying this is kind of unique in that typically a company will move forward, advance new stuff, and then it, the problems get regulated later. Obviously, four out of five doctors used to choose camel cigarettes, and uh, it wasn't until you know so much lung cancer death that finally regulation happened there. And the same was true with pesticides and DDT and whatever with leaded gasoline. Um, you remember in the fifties, people spraying DDT on everything, right? It was just mosquito on themselves, food and and Rachel Carson had to work so hard. And then when we finally banned it, all the harm had already occurred. Um, but the 20, 30, 80 years that it takes afterwards with things that have faster and faster effects, like effects of synthetic bio and AI, it just won't work. By the time that the harm is that clear, the world will be destroyed. So we actually have to move to a place where with new technologies that can have such a rapid effect on the world, we do the process to anticipate the unanticipated nth order effects and figure out the right paths for the commercialization of the technology with a regulatory process. So that is actually something that I think the world will have to move to to make it out of the meta crisis. Of course, that means we have to have regulation that is both effective and competent and that we trust and there's lots of things involved in that. So I want to see super strict regulation here. I want to see a company that really cares about that with independent oversight from MIT and Oceanographic Institute's looking at it. Um, and I do want to see very uh, complex comparisons of the trade-offs between surface mining and alternative energy storage technologies and all of those things. One of the things that had me actually make friends with Gerard and 
um, Erica, who's not on the call, but is brilliant, uh, and why they kind of picked the name Metals Co. is that, like the moment we can get these metals from recycled sources because there are enough metals, we'll switch and not do them from sea sources. If there was a better source, we would move to that. The key is actually how do we create a closed loop material economy. A closed loop material economy writ large takes a fuck ton of energy. It's one of the big challenges. So if to survive planetary boundaries, we need to make a closed loop materials economy. So we're not making anything from virgin resources and turning it into trash and pollution. And we have to make a closed loop materials economy with renewable energy. Then being able to boot the renewable energy system to close loop everything else is one of the first kind of big keys to that. And I think one of the places where challenges occurred, like, you know, I know other major multinational type companies that would invest less in science and more in lobbying the International Seabed Authority and uh, other groups, I'm sure, will work to do that. I actually really like a group that is focused on the science to work, um, you know, the process formally. Um, but obviously, when there's a negative environmental narrative, that makes it risky for investors. And I, one of the things that I respect is that, you know, they have invested in having some of the best ocean scientists and conservationists on their team working on how do you, in order to do this well, how do you make it different? And it has involved changes to the original tech significantly based on how to really do it properly. I had a conversation with Gerard and Gregory Stone around that. There was like really interesting um, topics of how to make sure that the thermal clines and the saline clines are protected as vertical movement is happening. How do you test all the heavy metals in the sediment to make sure? How do you make sure that the biodiversity is indexed well? Just all those topics in depth. And they have held the position that any environmental scientists or environmental groups that want to come talk with them and have an earnest conversation privately or publicly can. Privately, and they won't comment on it. Publicly, in front of an open debate, happy to do so. And I would feel very happy to see anyone do that and do it with the frames that say, not just do the thing or don't do the thing, but really engage with the complexity of the trade-offs of the space. And um, insofar as anyone really could propose a comprehensively better approach to meet the world's needs, I know that this company would look at how to leverage its assets to change, which mm -hmm. is why I like them as people. Um, and if no one does have a comprehensively better approach, then I think being good environmentalists obligate saying, wow, if this is the best enactable approach we can currently see for the environment writ large, and we don't just care about the environment of this area or of this metric, but comprehensively, then let's be clear on that. And mm -hmm. so the other thing I would invite is anyone who has environmental concerns to actually engage in conversation, mm -hmm. um, not just you know, hit pieces, but like actually have a debate publicly or reach out privately. Um, and, uh, you know, whether Gerard or the scientists on the team, they're happy to have those conversations mm -hmm. and happy to publicly, you know, document uh, those conversations. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, uh, we are coming slowly but surely to the end of this uh, extraordinary podcast i've learned so much and i'm deeply grateful to be connected with you and uh be um, a, a tiny little vehicle for taking the wor word out into a world that uh needs to get better informed and uh, maybe as it just is a not very um small side note anna Luz and i are members of the resource uh transition group uh, together with uh, other major members of the Club of Rome. It's a European initiative, and uh, which is the reason why she and I were very excited to engage in this conversation. And uh, we're deeply grateful for this beautiful example of addressing um, the meta crisis by bringing in people who have shifted already their minds and are providing solutions and are open to the reg regulatory necessities uh, that this transition require in order to create a, a better, more integral world for us. So I would like to thank all of you for being part of this. And uh, and uh, I couldn't be more grateful uh, for knowing you. And uh, I know the world is better because you exist, uh, because we all know that uh, on a round planet, there is no choosing upsides. We're all in the same boat. And uh, so please engage with us in a positive way to create a better world. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>